Hey, it's Alex Williams, the new stack. Friday afternoon in Copenhagen, the last day of KubaCon plus Cloud Native Con. You know what the funny thing is? Like, it seems like it got busier every day. I don't know. Did you have more people coming in during the show? Not much, but we, just, had, we were full from the get go. That's great. But I want to just start and thank you for that amazing party last night at the, the Tivoli Gardens. This is a historic amusement park, more than 100 years old, I think, right? It was fantastic. It was just really so great, so thank you so but much. But of course, it is the people there that makes it so much fun, and I, I had a great time as well. Yeah, there are a lot of people now, aren't there? <laughs> there are, there's 4,300, and lots of huggy. Huggy? <laughs> huggy? <laughs> huggy. Huggy. <laughs> what does huggy Huga. mean? Huggy. Huggy. Co- it doesn't translate perfectly, but it's cozy or warm, and it's what Denmark is uh, supposed to be famous for. Okay. And this so, venue is just fantastic. It's it's the most amazing venue I've seen. Neat stuff. But we had a theme in Austin of Keep Cloud Native Weird, and then we extended that here with uh, Keep Cloud Native uh, Huge. Huge. And then Huge. Uh, we'll see how we can extend that trend for Shanghai in November. And yeah, Seattle so what's it going to be in Shanghai? Keep Pro- Cloud? It's a little boring, but probably spicy. Spicy. And then uh, caffeinated would be the obvious. Caffeinated part. for Seattle? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, well, great. Well, we wanted to talk about two topics, didn't we, Libby? One is like really about the, you know, the community, overall community. And also, what are the, some of the, and we also want to talk about governance, didn't we? The health of the project and the long-term viability. How do you, you know, keep a, an open source project healthy and what, how you measure health in a project? So, I, yeah, so go ahead. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think that uh, the Kubernetes community has done a lot of thinking around uh, the health of the community and uh, governance models. And, uh, you know, Sarah Novotny is not here today, but uh, uh, she's done a lot of work on articulating the values that the Kubernetes community holds. Um, and, of course, uh, we've set up a steering committee that is elected by the community um, that, um, well, first of all, formulates the values, but then also takes care of the health of the community and issues uh, that that may arise in the community, whether they be interpersonal issues or technical issues, they can be um, uh, they can be sent to the steering committee, and the steering committee intervenes and they gives a lot of, they give a lot of guidance. I mean, it's a it's really a it's not a top down structure, uh, especially open source. Um, but having the um, some of the most respected people in the community on the governing uh, uh, the governing board or the governing Governance uh, committee, steering committee, is um, is how is how we've been structuring it in Kubernetes. And I think to reflect on the values that Sarah's been codifying, and she really has been a collector of those values, observing them, seeing them in play, and how they actually affect and, and act in the community. The a level down from the steering committee is the special interest groups, and what you have is these aggregations of subject matter expertise around things like networking or storage. And then you have some sort of cross-cutting uh, special interest groups, like a partner and myself uh, participate in SIGPM, which is focused on product, project, and program management. So what we're really trying to do is, is get decision-making as close as possible to the people who are most capable of making those decisions in a way that's reflective of community values and the needs of the project as a whole. It seems like, though, that at the same time, you can only make decisions by the people who are already in the community, right? So, yes. So how do you start to build the community, grow the number of contributors, the right. diversity of the contributors, so that decisions are starting to be made and, you know, um, I guess more... Uh, by a more diverse yeah. group of people. So I think the first step is actually uh, observing what's happening in the community. Uh, and, 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 you know, the metrics actually help a lot with that. Um, and that's something that the CNCF has assisted with, with setting up dev stats. So you're monitoring how many unique contributors are there, um, how much uh, volume is there in terms of commits, where is that coming from? And then as a group, um, we get together actually at every KubeCon, we have a developer summit or a contributor summit. And we also have a kind of a leadership uh, summit, which is the con- leads of all of the SIGs, and we look at those metrics and say, well, wh- where do we need to go? And some of the things that we noticed, you know, through the course of last year was, well, we really need to stabilize this project. Maybe test quality is not as high. Um, there's there's lots of distributions. We need to work on a conformance program. We need to get uh, the contributor path ironed out better, so it's it's easier for people to participate. One of the things is, as the project has gotten bigger, people don't know how to contribute and how to 
do they get in and who do they go to? So um, Paris, who's not here uh, at the moment, uh, she's been working on a easier on-ramp for contributors and kind of a mentoring program. And that's like a huge passion of hers. And so we identify these areas and then, of course, someone volunteers um, and uh, spearheads that area and creates a solution. Dan, what's the role of the CNCF in, in that? Yeah, thankfully the role of the CNCF is, has been able to be pretty small for a lot of these areas. There's um, a European Union concept called uh, subsidiarity, which is to try and push every decision possible as low as it can be. And so within the Kubernetes project, uh, they ha now have this, these concepts called sub-projects that can pop up and work on something specific. And if they can resolve it and create new code and, and, and do it, then it does. If not, it can pop up to SIGs. You have this new working group structure, which can be cross-SIGs. Things that get escalated could go up to uh, the Kubernetes Steering Committee. In principle, things could be um, appealed to the Technical Oversight Committee or the CNCF Governing Board, but essentially that would only happen if there was some sense in which uh, the steering committee wasn't following its own processes, and, and thankfully that's never needed to be the case. Our, we have a, a philosophy in CNCF. There is no CNCF way that we say, here's the proper way to run an open source project. We have what we call a bring your own governance process. Now, in reality, none of the projects that come to CNCF so far have been sort of fully baked, and so they've had to, they've needed to each go through a process, and it's actually been somewhat long and painful for several of them, like Kubernetes and Prometheus, and we've offered suggestions along the way or offered to provide help, but bluntly, most of them have been able to come up with things that they are happy with and, and that they uh, go forward on. So in a lot of ways, I really see CNCF's role as more just providing resources to help those projects be successful. Uh, and DevStats, and I'll, I'll give that shout out, it's, it's ks.devstats.cncf.io is a good example of that, um, where the, the project wanted more information on what they were doing. Um, and then a certified Kubernetes would be probably a bigger... Thing. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, first I want to say from the point of view of the Kubernetes community, we really pride ourselves, I think, um, on being a merit-based community. So the more you contribute, the more you have uh, the ability to contribute, and the quality of your contributions really matter. And that's how, you know, that's why the steering committee is election-based and, and so forth. Um, but um, where the CNCF has been really helpful, um, obviously, with the conformance program. So the conformance program is something that also came out of the community in terms of uh, the idea of the conformance program and the writing of the tests and the test suites. But the CNCF really helped to broaden it and to enforce it um, and also to assist with the test suites. So where we need assistance, we reach out to the CNCF. And it has been a great funding body. Um, and so now we've been talking about a bounty uh, security, uh, you know, a related bounty program with the CNCF. So those are some of the things that, obviously, in addition to uh, dev stats um, that the CNCF provides. And then from an open source projects perspective beyond Kubernetes, in terms of the Kubernetes ecosystem and beyond, um, the CNCF is a, well, the, the, the technical oversight committee of the CNCF is, is the body that selects the projects that uh, that go into the CNCF. So are you guys hiring dev developers to do the testing then right now? We um, have created a um, program, it's, it's really just sort of uh, starting up right now where we're using an external test shop in Argentina uh, to do some test development. But I really want to emphasize that the governing board, which is you know, ultimately my boss and, and funding that work, sees this as a temporary uh, sort of paying off of technical debt. In a lot of ways, the more important step was to say that new features and new uh, options are coming into Kubernetes at any time and SIG architecture, which ultimately controls this definition of what it means to be Kubernetes, to be conformant, they uh, set down a rule a few months ago saying that uh, new things could come in to alpha or beta stage, but they can only reach stable if uh, they have these conformance tests included in them. Right, so conformance really is defined by SIG architecture, which is the le you know technical leadership of the Kubernetes community, and so they define what is core Kubernetes. Um, yeah, and so, and, and I'm part of the governing board of the CNCF, and I think uh, the board does not want to manage the project, um, uh, any project, um, and, and, and that feeling of the community is very strong. But, but on this temporary piece, once they've set this rule, so we're not going to dig the hole any deeper, 
of uh, Kubernetes API features that don't have conformance tests, but the reality is that there are a bunch of those APIs today that don't have them. And so that we agreed that we were going to go begin this effort to try and backfill and, 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 and complete uh, get out of that technical gap. Right, for the developers, what do they want? They want access to the APIs, right? They mean inside Kubernetes, right? Well, I mean, they want the they want the distribution to be robust enough. The developers want well. They want innovative features. Right. They also want stability. They want to know, you know, they want us to set expectations in terms. Well, what stage is a particular feature? What's coming next? When will it be? You know, some level of predictability. I think that's one of the things. Yeah, that the predictability. Got. I think the is a aspiration yeah. is that if you install an app and it works correctly on uh, OpenShift that you should be able to move to GKE or EKS or any of the 55 certified Kubernetes distributions. There's 55? Exactly. There were, there was 55 or six months ago, so. If six months ago, I think there were 20 something, but oh, I, mean, I thought there were more than ago, that. Zero. It, it's right. been an insanely successful program that we have essentially every vendor in the space has signed on to this program. So is, is yeah. committed to work together. So as kind of like, you know, uh, cloud services are adopting Kubernetes, for example, and hosting providers, they may be on, this is the issue with conformance, right? They may, they may be on different versions of uh, you know of Kubernetes. Yeah, so right. so you you are conformant for a particular version. Right. So conformance carries a version with it. So if you're conformant to 1.8, that means that you run the tests associated with 1.8 and conformance is only valid for the period of a, of 1 year from the date that the release was cut. So the 1.8 release was cut um, in September or October of uh, 2017. And so if you certified today to 1.8, then you will be conformant until September of 2018, and then you need to recertify to a different version. So, conformance actually has the concept of upgrading baked into it. If I could give one level more detail, so today you can actually only can do the current version or the previous version. So you can't even certify a new 1.8 distro. It's only 1.9 or 1.10. But what's interesting is that if, like GKE, you certified to 1.7 a year ago, as long as you keep doing a newer version and it's, GKE does all of them, but if you could even skip, you could do one every one, one a year, 1.7, 1.11, 1.15, uh, then your old versions do remain conformant. But if you ever go without a year of having a new uh, conformant version, then uh, your old ones lose certification. And this is pretty powerful, we think, because it keeps people on the release train and saying, yes, they are going to make the new features of Kubernetes commercially available, but they can still support an old version if they want to. Yeah, and I think it's very, very important for developers because um, not only is it uh, you know, enabling the interoperability or some guarantee of interoperability, but also predictability. So when you think about, here's what's in 1.8, if that's a conformant distribution of, of 1.8, then you know that it's going to work the way that it was intended. So that, that predictability is very, very important. So, so I'm sorry. I was just going to ask. You know, from your perspective, then, what? How is the, the, the You know, what is your job then? You know, to managing the the, gov the governance model really and helping understand the governance model. Like, and how and how do you how are you planning to adapt? Right. You know, as that. You know, as the community grows. There are 4,300 people here. My, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll put it on the line. My guess is 8,000 for Seattle. That's what uh, that I'm going to you know I'm going to just put that out there, um, but um, if you have that many developers kind of involved and just kind of at a conference, the user space is some exponential you know number beyond that. So and there has been numbers quoted throughout the conference about the number of developers who are going to see, you know, enter um, the professional you know workspace, 100 million developers by, you know, in 10 well, years. Well, so. I think at its core, governance is really about fusing the needs of the community and the needs of the users of the product together. Um, governance in its best form is a way of providing transparency and a way of audit auditability across how decisions are made and to help preserve that transparency. Google is really serious about governance and trying to have super healthy, inclusive, diverse communities. And governance is a way of sort of leveling the field on that regard, um, to have accountability around those concepts. Because people can say, well, we want to promote diversity and we want to promote inclusion, but that's only as good as the actions behind that. And so we are constantly trying to be observant and vigilant of those things. Like, for example, making sure that our code of conduct, the CNCF code of conduct, and, and all things around that are very uh, obvious to people who participate in these events. 
So that's sort of a uniting force that governance plays in terms of uh, tangible results at our conferences and the ways that we uh, interact with one another. Um, Governance is also a way to scale human uh, trust, that we have community of trust between organizations and different bodies uh, across the organization. So SIGs have trust from the steering committee and working groups have trust from the SIGs and sub-projects have trust from the SIGs. So it's just a way to uh, spread out, to load balance, if you will, the, the trust in our community. Yeah, I mean, as you know, Kubernetes um, is sort of, uh, it, it, it's uh, its like a baby, uh, you know, for Google. It's, uh, it's something that started at Google, and um, it's really very important for us to ensure that, um, you know, it thrives and it grows. And uh, as you said, it is growing very quickly. Um, and this is why we formed SIG Architecture, and Brian Grant, one of the founders of the project, um, uh, and a principal engineer at, at Google, he is very devoted to uh, ensuring the stability of the core, and um, Tim Hawkin and others as well, making sure that we're not uh, growing, uh, you know, at a pace that uh, that is unsustainable. Um, and similarly, on the governing side, um, and we already mentioned Sarah, uh, making sure that the values um, of the community are encapsulated and and you know. I will mention one other uh, strength of, of the involvement with CNCF where Kubernetes is such an extraordinary success that um, if CNCF didn't exist, all of this, these other projects uh, would, <laughs> I'll start that again, all of these other projects, all of this other code would try to get into Kubernetes to say, oh, how can we get involved in that? How can we be it? But there's an aspiration among particularly SIG architecture, but I really think within the entire community to try and make Kubernetes small. And so, for example, one of the areas there is that uh, the Google Cloud functionality, and, and for another seven of uh, the core clouds, is being factored out of Kubernetes so that it doesn't have to be built into every version. But there's a ton of subsidiary projects of things like uh, Scaffold and Conico from Google, or Draft and Brigade from Microsoft, um, a Teleprisms from a startup DataWire that are all trying to improve the ecosystem and those can actually come to CNCF and become CNCF projects and hopefully get a Peloton effect of being involved in Kubernetes and being seen as smart ways or integrated ways of doing things. But uh, I think a lot of people have the goal of Kubernetes being smaller rather than at the code now. The community is definitely going to get larger. The code, uh, I was looking at the numbers, it has grown 10x since the 1.0. So we're, we just <laughs> finished uh, 1.10, and the code is literally 10x bigger. Uh, um, the cloud yes. piece will help that. That might actually yeah, so the um, uh, the cloud piece is, is, is no different from the storage piece or the networking piece or the runtime pieces. We're establishing interfaces, um, pluggable interfaces for things that should be pluggable. And um, you know, so the cloud provider interface allows you to plug in different uh, different infrastructure underneath Kubernetes. And so um, you know, whether that's VMware or it's uh, it's any other kind of environment, OpenStack, um, that's what the cloud provider interface is for. Yeah, and I think uh, just generally speaking, from the architecture standpoint, uh, extensibility is the future. We want a thriving ecosystem with a very stable core. And so uh, we really want to make sure that uh, we're anticipating needs through creating genericized interfaces as opposed to trying to do specific implementations. And it also speeds up innovation because the Absolutely. innovation yeah. can happen Absolutely. at a different cycle. Yep. It's encouraging to me to hear you talk about uh, project health, not just in terms of gr pure growth. Um, so if you're talking about scaling back the code base, making it more manageable, you know, um, it's not just about pushing, <laughs> pushing them the limits. We've had trouble um, at that little that place all week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you know that that actually raises something that I heard in the keynotes uh, today, which was, you know, so I think somebody uh, said something to, along the lines of Kubernetes is so 2015, and that the <laughs> next thing is, ser is serverless. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about you know how you envision sort of you know that slowing of the growth and the and the more stable maintenance of the project and to and to allow for for you know new evolutions of the project. So I'll, I'll part of the furniture, first. as I heard one person say. We love say. serverless. We think uh, serverless is, is the future in a lot of ways, and uh, we also expect that the vast majority of serverless in, in the future is probably going to be running on top of Kubernetes. So uh, there's been a serverless working group in. Uh, CNCF, there's also a ton of other efforts going on on it, but one of the really neat things is to look at 
with great strengths of serverless, the developer model of, of how easy it is to code, the infinite scalability, the micro billing, and decompose those aspects. Mm -hmm. say, how can we make them available actually in an open source way um, that uh, avoids provider lock-in? And so there's been a ton of interest there. We've had a very popular serverless track uh, here in at KubeCon, Cloud NativeCon. So we've had uh, projects like OpenFAS, Kubeless, Fission, um, I'm going to leave a couple out and, and really upset people. They're all on the serverless landscape, I might add, at uh, s.cncf.io. I, I don't have a prediction for you yet on which are going to be the winning ones, but um, I think there's a very good chance it'll be Kubernetes. Yeah, I think there's a couple couple of aspects to serverless. Kubernetes, first of all, is, is a platform, and so it runs lots of different things. Um, there are 15 serverless frameworks that run on Kubernetes. Um, so clearly it's a, it's a popular platform for serverless. Um, I think the thing that I'm most excited about serverless um, and, and what Kubernetes brings here is that it'll be open. Um, you know, and uh, um, serverless technology being something that uh, runs on a platform that runs anywhere and is open is going to unlock um, new innovation. And then the other piece is uh, really just, um, you know, being able to use infrastructure very efficiently and um, for short periods of time. Um, Kubernetes and containers are, are really ideal for that, and which is why it's, it's, uh, it's the basis of serverless. And so, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, so to touch another point on what you said about velocity slowing in the project, um, feature velocity, feature richness is probably going to be the focus. So instead of, you know, when, when Kubernetes first came out, a lot of the focus was on what's missing. And right now, what we're looking at is what's present and what needs to be richer. So a lot of the development is in, in enhancing and promoting and, and creating more stability and richness around existing feature so, sets. So what, are you, so what are you trying to make richer? Um, everything that is implemented in some way could so be So for example, so. what are some of the implementation? Well, I think like all the storage, the storage interface, and networking interface, all those things, um, using gRPC in interesting ways to, to provide hooks out to uh, certificate providers, uh, just generally speaking, stability of code, so a lot of bug fixes going in, that's a huge thing. So 1.10, we had a slightly lower feature uh, density, but our, in terms of bug fixes and stability going into the code, there was a lot. So that's really, really important. I mean, I mentioned three key areas in my keynotes in terms of looking back and also looking forward for the roadmap, uh, security, uh, applications, greater application support, um, that's actually a, a very, very interesting area. And then developer experience, all three areas actually. I, I think those are innovation areas. When you, what do you mean by application support? So a platform is only as good as the applications that it can run. And right now, Kubernetes, I mean it started, uh, containers started as being the platform for stateless applications. And we've uh, traveled a lot further than that. Um, actually on GKE, 40 plus percent of clusters are running stateful applications, which is a very healthy number. And so so the, the, um, the constructs that were required to run stateful applications like data stores, databases, um, are there. And not only are they there, uh, users are using them, which is very nice and very encouraging. And then, of course, um, analytics um, with Spark and batch processing, uh, and then uh, machine learning. Uh, this platform, Kubernetes, is very popular, and I think now getting to be proven for these types of workloads. There are other workloads still in the enterprise that we that we have yet to address. And I think there was a customer here that spoke about how they want uh, they don't want two platforms. They don't want like a fast platform and a slow platform. They just want one platform for everything in the enterprise, and it should be the fast platform. <laughs> <laughs> Magic. Yes. Um, you know, when it comes down to thinking about, um, you know, the, the, the community and how that community is going to, uh, you know, change um, over the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, what are the, you know, I often, I mean, I, I learned this from someone recently about how they, when they do interviews, they talk about, they ask questions about what is a dysfunctional environment to you? Now, have you ever been in a dysfunctional environment? And how would you find your, and how have you adapted to that dysfunctional environment, right? What is that dysfunctional environment that you want to just keep so far away from Kubernetes so it doesn't affect you? Because one of the problems with growth 
is that lack of vision, right? Is that, you know, so maybe you can help us kind of think of that in the context of the values that you're setting, you know, to help them think of this kind of like, you know, these two these two opposites, so that because we don't want the dysfunctional you know world, but you always got to be thinking about what are those kind of issues that are out there that could that that, that need to be paid attention to to prevent that. I'll maybe start here where I, I don't feel like Jason and Bernard in some ways are taking enough credit for what an extraordinary accomplishment Kubernetes is. D depending on the way you measure it, you can argue that it's the third largest uh, distributed project, distributed communications, distributed infrastructure, distributed project of any kind that's ever existed. Exactly. Wikipedia I, would be first yes. and Linux would be second. Right. And so uh, at times it felt like we've had a little bit of a success disaster of uh, people getting overwhelmed by different things and not being able to respond to issues or right. uh, figuring out the governance and, and, and trying to change that on the fly and such. But the fact that it, it does still seem to have this level of traction and engagement and such is I guess I, I guess I have one, one way to think about this is how does that translate into like GitHub? We were having this conversation before about you know Kubernetes representing something like 20% of GitHub's traffic, right? So how do you think about it, it was mentioned? It was mentioned. You know, this is something that was actually said. I can't remember if it was in a public place or not, but someone was saying. It actually, it was a conversation I had with someone. This was their claim, right? They're pretty well, they're one of the contributors to the Kubernetes, and so they have some context, I expect. I don't know what they're basing upon or what that 20% actually means, but anyway, it's significant, right? There's no doubt about that. But how does this then translate into the, the, the tool sets that you're developing, or that need to be developed to kind of help manage kind of these very, this unprecedented type of community that is using GitHub but is but the but there's a lot of falling down. There's a lot of you know issues that need to come. I'm, I'm curious about that direction and how that will play out through the values that you're speaking of. Well, so one of the things, another value is around automation. So if if we can have automation take place and take the place of human processes, that's something that's really core to how we try and operate. So as a release leader for 1.8 and 1.10, um, uh, even those nine months uh, between when I started 1.8 and when we finished 1.10, we saw a tremendous uptick in automation and we're um, implementing improvements around how we handle uh, the integration testing and the, the just the general release processes. Uh, also trying to make it so that it's less Google-centric in terms of the release process mechanics. So again, we're trying to identify those areas where automation makes just perfect sense, and that helps uh, take some of that edge off of uh, the human and, and scale-related issues with GitHub and also the release process. I don't usually think of the word dysfunctional when I think of the Kubernetes community or the Kubernetes project. So I have uh, there's just no association with that. I think that um, certainly growth has its challenges, and uh, we are very. Um, well, you're uh, trying. I, I think any organization is trying to avoid dysfunction. Sure. Would you, would you agree with that? Well, I think we have a, a slightly greater ambition than that than just <laughs> avoiding this. We want to be highly That's functional. That's very true. I would say we that. We want to be highly functional, highly productive. But it comes down to how you manage. And, and inviting and transparent. Um, I think uh, you know those are all uh, our goals. Are, are I would state them that way. Um, yeah, I think uh, one t form of dysfunction that uh, we're trying to avoid is um, where there isn't contribution, where people are not contributing to the project. Um, you know, and and instead there's just consumption of the project. I think that is um, that's why we monitor. Uh, level of contribution and um, and then also type of contribution. I think some of it uh, is encapsulated in the chop wood carry water, right? Um, uh, so if the project needs documentation or the project needs testing or the project needs project management, um, um, you know that is something that's a shared responsibility amongst all of the companies that are part of the community. Uh, and and certainly the technical contributions. That's how you that's how you earn your stars in. In, in the Kubernetes community, and that's, I think that's a form of function. We have very high aspirations for, for, for that form of function and, and recognition. Mm -hmm. And I'd also add that as a community, we're very cognizant of other communities. 
Um, you know, when you're on, when you're taking a cross-country flight, there's three jets in front of you, and they're constantly talking between each other about, hey, you've gonna, you're going to hit some turbulence over Tulsa or wherever that is. And what we do as a community, we have these dialogues. Um, in fact, there was one um, a couple days ago between the OpenStack community and Kubernetes about how, what are the things that went wrong or what are the things that went right, and how do we share those learnings across projects? You see that Cloud Foundry is actively involved in this, and that we're sharing stories there and learning how to, to leverage those best practices practices or where things work well. So we're, we're constantly engaged in a very constructive dialogue around what are the things that we know are anti-patterns and how do we avoid those. Yeah, it is not just um, foundations and so forth. It is very much individuals. Um, and, uh, you know, Google, for example, uh, I think we have grown our individual contribution to, I was looking at the numbers to, to Kubernetes, to now 350 or so engineers that work on the Kubernetes project. It's the single largest team that works on the Kubernetes project. But it's very, very important to us that um, other companies contribute um, and, and, and contribute meaningfully to the, to the technical aspects of the project and the non-technical aspects of the project. So creating an inviting environment. And I think if we lose that, that's a form of dysfunction. Um, also for users, so again, framing that in terms of our aspiration, we want users to contribute. There was a really good talk uh, yesterday, keynote by um, Spotify about um, users and, and how users can contribute uh, and, and what the benefits of that are for other users. Dave Zalutsky, and it was a almost yeah, a, that was a great talk. emotional talk where he just talked about how grateful he was for what he's able to take advantage. And this is, of course, the, the whole idea behind open source that maybe we don't always live up to, but I, it, I found it inspiring to hear his, his commitment to contribute back as well. So you just mentioned, though, that Google has 350 engineers um, devoted to contributing to the project, and I believe that Google is the top or one of the top contributors to the project in, in yes. general. So is that, if you're looking to diversify well, the actually, contributions? two amazing graphs where uh, Google's contributions have actually been going up over time, but their contribution as a percentage of the whole Proportion. has been going down because there's so many other uh, companies that are now engaged in, in working with it, which is mm -hmm. really the ideal of what you would hope for. Yeah, the um, the total uh, contributor unique monthly count is, I think, now at 1,700, and it has grown um, 6x um, from the 1.0 release. So, uh, and, and not everybody is contributing in equal measure, but but um, that that count is important. And um, Google contributing more. A lot of our contribution is actually mentoring other contributors and bringing them up uh, the ladder of contribution. Well, I guess as more contributors come in, then you know, how can they, you know, for the ones who are out there who are just thinking about getting, you know, who are just very new to this world, how would you recommend they get involved and like in like start to like learn how to participate in this organization and you know and, and you know and just live it? To some degree. Yeah, that, that's front of mind because it is a, it's a large project with a lot of moving parts. So there is a SIG contributor experience which is dedicated to that very problem. So on the Kubernetes community site, you can find that uh, weekly meeting for SIG contributor experience. And it's a great place for people to go and just get the lay of the land and understand uh, how to contribute. And uh, like was mentioned earlier, Paris um, Pittman has this wonderful mentoring program which is spinning up that is uh, walking through junior people. Uh, I had actually was talking to somebody who was in this in SIG storage as a, as a new contributor and was just saying it's such a relief to know how to navigate this, this landscape and to know that you're working with great people like Saad Ali on, on this storage. You're literally working with one of the world's foremost experts on container and other you know, storage. Like, what, what communities make that easy for a junior developer? It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, and we've got, we have the diversity scholarships. Um, that's a, 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 that's been a great uh, program, and we we very much uh, invite um, you know women and students and uh, folks fr uh, from all backgrounds to come and contribute um, and start get started. Um, all of the SIGs have had um, introductory tracks here at KubeCon. Um, we did our SIG track, and uh, SIG PM is actually doesn't require a technical background, so you can come in from any kind of background. You can start contributing. We have a lot of we have a lot of exciting, uh, um, you know, work that um, that uh, that that is a direct contribution and, and a great contribution to the project. So many ways to get involved. 
Um, one quickly, too, is give a plug for the release team, which is emerging as one of the primary ways to get involved in the, the project. Ah. Yeah, we've had two or three uh, different uh, presentations about that, and there's a great recent blog post. Uh, yeah. Seeing docs, yep. writing docs. Writing docs. That's something a non-technical person Absolutely. can do, pretty much. Yeah. 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 Uh, Perna mentioned this concept of contributor ladder. And you know it is totally fine to just use Kubernetes and not not contribute back. It, 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 you're you're giving a, a, up something and a, and a chance for development and such. But it's totally legal. It's ethical. All those sort of things. But our ideal, our hope, is that a lot of people will start out just as a user. And for almost everyone, the first thing is they just have some itch that they want to scratch. They see some annoying bug in the documentation. There's something about their environment that's a little bit different and they need to figure it. And what we're trying, we're doing a good job at, we're trying to get even better at is to say, okay, how do we take that person that maybe made their first pull request and then help them along to do something more substantial, maybe become a reviewer and then eventually move up to things like SIG lead or, or steering committee, or not. Or that they could just stay as a substantial uh, contributor forever. I, I will give a quick shout out, uh, Julia Evans, at Stripe uh, wrote a blog post that I just think is fantastic about them adopting Kubernetes internally and she just described, uh, she had a, some challenging use cases around cron jobs, regular jobs, and she found bugs. And she uh, read the Go code and found it pretty accessible and uh, submitted pull requests on them. And then the feedback was, oh, that's not quite right, you didn't consider this corner case. But the fact that you can click through from her blog post and see those pull requests and see the way she engaged with the community, uh, I found pretty inspiring. Mm. Mm. Well, good. Um, so, I guess we're coming up to the end of uh, our recording. I just had a follow-up question for you, Dan, about, you know, you, you, know, you, were, you were saying how um, you know the management of those uh, of of the of the organizations that are part of the Linux Foundation, part of CNCF, manage themselves, I and mean, it's like an EU type of a policy, where then you you're really wanting them to kind of you know think through the problems that they're having and, and figure those out. So, what is the investment that the CNCF makes? What is that investment that you'll make? You know, over what's going to be just a really, really explosively. You know, which is going to be a year or another of, I think, you know, of substantial growth and over time, you know, as well. Um, so the most substantial investment that we make is we have something called the CNCF Service Desk, and every maintainer of all 20 CNCF projects get uh, an account on it, and it's just a place to ask for things. And people ask for really trivial stuff on it. Uh, I mean, can I get T-shirts for this um, thing that I'm doing? Can I? Uh, get um, a, uh, a new logo from my site. We get much more substantial things of, of, hey, I have this new code that I want to take into my repo, I'm worried about the license behind it, can you do a scan? But I really do want to emphasize that in some ways the best thing that CNCF can do is to be an extremely responsive uh, organization where we see the maintainers of the existing project as being our core constituency. And if they're happy with the services that we're providing, then they'll be more successful and then tons of new projects will want to come in. Any last thoughts, Libby, to ask anyone before we go? No, I guess, um, I, guess I, I would love to just hear what your vision is for that, for the the end of the project, the health of the project. Um, you know, that I, I know that they're all good projects must come to an end. Um, when Kubernetes bot, bot reaches sentience and uh, takes over the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because that's, that's something you have to plan for, right? Yeah, I, I, I think in a way, yes. Um, I think that there are, no matter what happens with the technology, everything that we're doing and learning is enduring. Um, this is a this is a watershed moment as a technology uh, community. We, I really do believe that we have had some awarenesses evolve around this project that will not go away. Um, I think we're really in a position where this is hitting all the right notes at the right time in the right place, and it's setting. Did the you say nodes or notes? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm a musician, so it's notes. But, uh, so it's really, um, it's. It, the zeitgeist of what we're in right now is something that people are going to look back on for a long time and understand that this was a moment where everything changed. And everybody and everything involved in this, the CNCF, all the companies that contribute, the individuals, 
we're all going to be able to look back on this and say, wow, that was a really pivotal moment in the history of technology. Uh, my vision for the future of Kubernetes is that um, it is that uh, platform for transformation in the enterprise and that it is widely adopted across uh, enterprise and across clouds um, uh, to enable uh, developer productivity, high utilization, um, and uh, multiple applications to be that one platform. Well, thank you all. This has been a wonderful conversation. It's been a great event. We've really enjoyed it here. We've had some fantastic conversations and just look oh, forward to it. You've been with us for years now. We yeah. You're going to stay, stick around at all yeah. the events as well. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. We really love being part of this community and trying to explain the things that are pretty complicated, I think, to almost everyone to some degree. So uh, thanks, and uh, we'll see you at the next show. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks everybody.